First of all, I want to thank the organizers for creating the opportunity for me to, um, to present my work. Um, as you can see from the uh, screen that the title of the talk is Construction of Wigner Functions from Gage to Balance Classes of, it's a look, quite a long title, Classes of Unitary Irreducible Representations of Non-Commutative Quantum Mechanics. So first of all, um, by unitary irreducible representations of non-commutative quantum mechanics, I would mean the unitary irreducible representations of some, some nilpotent Lie group, okay? So I will first uh, tell how to obtain that, that nilpotent Lie group of interest, and then find its unitary dual and move on to the further discussions later on, okay? So it was a work done with, uh, with collaboration of Professor Hishamuddin Zainuddin from, from Institute of, uh, of research, uh, Mathematical Research from Malaysia. So um, here are the sketches of the talk. And, uh, let me directly move on. Uh, so first of all, I'll give you uh, a background discussion, uh, the motivation and background discussion of non-commutative quantum mechanics following which I will discuss uh, the construction of this uh, nilpotent Lie group GNC and uh, uh, find its unitary duals, following which uh, I will uh, describe how to find uh, un some unitarily equivalent representations of GNC that will give me some gauge structure involved in the, in the, in the situation. And, eventually uh, define um, gauge potentials out of that, out of those equivalent classes of representations. Okay, and finally we'll construct Wigner functions, and I did not mention here that I have some, uh, some future proposals that I, uh, I'm, I'm currently thinking on, I'll discuss it at the end. Okay, so here are the relevant publications, this was the uh, the latest publications here, where we uh, constructed this coming and going, uh, where we discussed this uh, construction of Wigner functions of equivalence classes, and uh, this work was actually uh, a, a sequel of the uh, the work here, where we worked out uh, the Wigner functions for. Uh, for certain gauges only, especially the the Landau gauge. I'll, I'll like describe what it, what it means the Landau gauge in this setting. <coughs> and uh, there was another paper um, published quite early, 2014, where uh, the the this the group of interest GNC was actually introduced. And uh, uh, here, so. Actually, I meant that this is the paper where we worked out the Wigner function for uh, for certain gauges, but we generalized it uh, in this paper. Okay. So, non-commutative quantum mechanics, which is abbreviated as NCQM, is the quantum mechanics in uh, in non-commutative configuration space. So, uh, here is the thing. So, we have this uh, phase space Q1, Q2, P1, P2. It's a, it's a it's up just R4, and um, if we centrally extend this uh, group of translations R4 by R, so that we have five parameters in this in this picture now, we we call it the the ordinary Weyl Heisenberg group. All right, and uh, if we find the the corresponding Lie algebra, the representation of that while Heisenberg Lie algebra looks like this. Okay. <clears throat> so these are the operators corresponding to Q1, Q2, P1, and P2. And, and these H bar, so, so let me move further, then I'll explain what, what this H bar, where this H bar actually comes from. So uh, here, like I told earlier, that, that's, that these Q, QI hats and PI hats are self adjoint representations of the corresponding universal enveloping algebra, and they're realized on L2 of R2. 
Okay, so the 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 operator corresponding to the central parameter theta is actually mapped to the scalar multiple of the identity operator in the representation space. Okay, so in contrast to this well-known and much studied representation of Weil Heisenberg group, if we consider instead of just one one local exponent, which was used to uh, centrally extend the, uh, the, the translation group of R4, if we use three inequivalent local exponents, I'll explain what it means by inequivalent local exponents in a minute. Um, then we arrive at something which is the GNC, which is a seven-dimensional real Lie group. So it's so it has uh, three, three, three generators, these three central generators actually, each corresponding to each of these central parameters. So we'll denote the three central parameters by theta, phi, and psi. The, the resulting group is nilpotent, and the group is, we call it by GNC. So this is a representation of the corresponding universal enveloping algebra of GNC. So here we see that the quantum mechanics is preserved, but we have these position operators also non-permuting, and also the momentum operators non-permuting. So now these H cross theta and B, I want to stress on this fact that they are not just, we are not putting them by hand, they are actually coming from the representations of the underlying group. Okay. So the central, the central generators of theta phi and psi are denoted by capital theta capital phi and capital psi, and they are, you know, the map to the scalar multiples of the identity operator on L2 of R2. Okay, so it's a quick recap of group extension theory. Um, you know, following the work of mm -hmm. Valentin Bergman. So here, given a connected and simply connected nil put, uh, simply connected Lie group, G, the like local exponents, which are uh, functions from G cross G to R, obey these relations, okay? And now, we call this, uh, so there, there is something called a co-boundary term which are defined by means of this continuous function from G to R, okay? And if I can, if I can write the local exponents using this continuous function in this way, I call this local exponent a co-boundary term. So when two local exponents differ from each other by a co-boundary term, they're called equivalent. So now, so here is the result that uh, if you have, so these are three inequivalent local exponents of uh, the group of translation of R4. Okay. So the, the proof is pretty simple. I'm not going over the proof. It's given in the paper. So you see that this is the thing that if we just work on Heisenberg group, you just use this, this local exponent only. So instead of using just one local exponent, we are using two more local exponents um, to obtain this centrally extended group, GNC. <coughs> so here is the group multiplication rule of GNC. It's topologically R7, and this is the group multiplication rule. See that this is, this is just the R4 part, and here the non-abelian non part is coming from the contribution of this, uh, these three um, extensions. So th these are the explanations of these uh, symbols, okay? Okay, so now we move on to uh, R6. Find, sorry? It's R6, no? No, R7. How did you get the seven? So it was previously R4, then we centrally extended it by R3, so we get our sudden. So now, see that 
So the coadjuvant action of the group on the dual Lie algebra, dual Lie algebra considered as a dual vector space only. So is is called the coadjuvant action, and the coadjuvant action of the group on the on the dual vector space looks like this. Okay, so under this action, we see that x5, x6, and x7 remain invariant. So these are the underlying polynomial inv invariants in the picture, and we denote them by rho, sigma, and tau, these three polynomial invariants. This triple, rho, sigma, and tau, determine, determine the, the dual entirely, completely. So this is how they are determined. So I want to move to a picture first. Let me, I could not embed this picture in the, in the beamer, that's why. So this is the picture. This is actually the rho sigma tau space, which is just R3. And inside this R3 is embedded this elliptic cone-shaped surface. Okay? So, so in this R sigma tau, uh, sorry, rho sigma tau space, you can be either inside this elliptic cone or outside or on the elliptic cone, you know or you know these these lines are deleted and so based on these pictures we have this classification let me go back to the classification three of them are zero, uh, non-zero, sorry, and you are not on the surface, I showed on the picture, you are not on the surface, then the coadjuvant orbits are all four-dimensional. Okay. Actually, this is the um, um, most non-trivial representations that we'll deal with, and we'll find the eco uh, equivalent unitary representations for this sector. Okay. So here is, uh, here is the case when we are on the surface. Okay. So in the physics literature of non-commutative quantum mechanics, you will see that when these guys go to zero, people say that the representations become reducible. But we have found that by the orbit method that it, it indeed gives you a, a unitary reducible representation for this case. But the point is that for, for this case, when you are on the surface, the coagent orbits are no longer R4, they are just R2. So they are dimensionally reduced for, this, uh, for, for the case of the surface. Okay, so now you choose rho and sigma to be non-zero, but tau to be zero you also get four-dimensional coadjuvant orbits. For rho and tau to be non-zero and sigma to be zero, you get four-dimensional orbits. For rho zero and tau and sigma non-zero, you also get four-dimensional orbits. This is the interesting representation. I mean, the coadjuvant orbits which gives interesting representations. You, you obtain quantum mechanics here. For for both sigma and tau to be zero, but rho non-zero. Here, you get four-dimensional coagent orbits which give you the quantum mechanical representation. For this case, when rho and tau both, to be zero, both are zero, but sigma non-zero, you have two-dimensional coagent orbits. But these are not physically interesting representations, actually. This is interesting, and from previous slide, well, this, this is interesting, and this is actually also this is also interesting. All right. Finally, finally, for rho sigma tau all zero, you have uh, you know a point. The 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 coagent orbits are zero dimensional, just points. Okay. Now uh, from from Kirillov's work, 
we we know that for for nil potent Li groups, the the coagent orbits and the unitary irreducible representations are in one-to-one -one correspondence. So because of that, you can find unitary repre irreducible representation for each of these coagent orbits. So this way, you know, you can classify all the unitary irreducible representations. So this is the case for when when you are on uh, away from the surface, and both and all three of them are non-zero. The representation looks like this. Okay. So we have also written the corresponding representation of the Lie algebra here. This looks like this, where you see that now everything looks physical because we have rewritten things in terms of h cross theta and b. Here, this b, when you divide by h cross, this 1 over rho alpha, represents the, the magnetic field, b. So in other words, the magnetic field, you are not putting in the theory by hand, it's coming automatically from the representation of the group. So is h cross, and so is this theta. They are all coming from the representation of G and C. So this B can be represent, uh, interpreted as the constant magnetic field that you put normally on the Q1 hat, Q2 hat plane. Okay. So this is the other representation, interesting, for which you are on the surface, the elliptic cone-shaped surface. And this is not realized on L2 of R2, rather it's realized on L2 of R. Okay, it's dimensionally reduced. And the representation looks like this. You see that there are um, you know, two, two other parameters coming because in the foliation, inside the R4, the, the two dimensional planes are foliated. So you need two other coordinates to represent them. That's why you have additional two, two other parameters appearing here. Okay. So this is the representation of the group, and the representation of the corresponding algebra looks like this. This is an irreducible representation of G and C. This is not, uh, this is not reducible, this is irreducible. But if you go back there, and if you choose theta, like people do in the business, if you choose, uh, you know, if you, if you impose h cross square minus b theta equal to zero here, you will find this representation to be reducible. But this is not one should do actually because when we obtain this represent, representation, we already assume that h cross square minus b theta is non-zero. So, so when you take the limit, it's reducible. It's natural that it will be reducible. For, for, to find the reducible representation, you have to impose this condition right from the beginning, and it, it gives you this representation, which is indeed an irreducible representation. Okay, but it's realized on L2 of R. Okay, so this way, you, so in the paper, we, we found all the corresponding representations of the groups and the corresponding Lie algebra. They are all found. Okay, so now, corresponding to the sector where rho square alpha square minus tau gamma sigma beta is non-zero, meaning that we are away from the surface, the elliptic cone shaped surface I told just uh, in the picture. Then, for those coagent orbits, you, you see that if you, if, you, if you change this rho sigma and tau, you go from one coagent orbit to another coagent orbit. And the corresponding representations are unitarily inequivalent. They are not equivalent. But lying on the same class, meaning that you were fixing rho sigma and tau once and for all, now you can find families of representations which are unitarily equivalent. This gives you the two parameter families of equivalent unitary representations. Fixing this rho sigma and tau. Once and for all, 
then you change L and M, you, what the, the representations you get are all unitarily equivalent to each other. <coughs> so it has been proved in the paper that these are act, indeed uh, irreducible, a representation of GNC, and um, they, are, they are unitary, and they are unitarily equivalent. So in order to find unitarily equivalent classes, you keep rho, sigma, and tau fix, and vary L and M. But here are some restrictions. L cannot achieve this value. L can be anything except for this. Your rho, sigma, and tau, they are fixed once and for all. L cannot take this value. And M can be anything, any real number. It's a continuous family of equivalent unitary representations. <coughs> so this is the corresponding representation of the algebra. See that M and L, they are all in the picture, but when you write the commutation, oh, let me go, oh. <laughs> when you write the commutation relations here, you see that M and L disappear from the commutation relations, they are no longer, which indeed represents the fact that they are the representations of G and C. So this is the representation of the algebra. Now, we 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 play with this uh, with this expression and write it like this in terms of this q1 hat and q2 hat. Okay. So we extracted this derivative operator from both the momentum expression. Now it motivates me to call this guy as the underlying vector potential. So this motivates me to give this definition. I call it non-commutative vector potentials. It's like operator value one forms, as you can see. So Q2 hat is an operator. Q1 hat is an operator. Both are operators on L2 of R2, given by this expression. So one should move on to looking at the, uh, you know, constructing the spectral triple. You know, the spectral triple, will po we, we possibly can choose the group, group sister algebra, a dense, pro proper dense subspace of the group sister algebra. And uh, the, the representation space, we can, we can choose L2 of R2. And the group sister algebra would be represented on the same representation space, you know, there will be an induction. And you, you can possibly find it. Of course, I think it's possible to find a good candidate of Dirac operator and, <coughs> and study the geometry that I haven't done so far. But there is a solid motivation of choosing this guy as the vector potential. So there are consequences. Let me explain. So the Landau gauge. So the Landau gauge is precisely due to L equal to 1 and M equal to 0. So if you, if you substitute L equal to 1 and M equal to 0, 0 here, you find this expression, where Q1 hat 0 is just this guy. And this is the magnetic field. So this is the famous Landau gauge that we obtain from our general expression of vector potential by choosing L to be 1 and M to be 0. Okay? All right. Self-adjoint representation of G and C in the Landau gauge looks like this. It's a little small font, but I, I, I think that still you can see it. So this is the representation of the, of the algebra in the Landau gauge. For the symmetric gauge, we have to choose L to be this guy. By checking the dimension, you see that if, if, if you can figure out that it is actually dimensionless. And we, we write this L as LS. S stands for symmetric gauge, and M to be 1 half. And now the vector potential, you know, the operator value vector potential looks like this. It can be verified that the following holds. If you choose L to be LS and M to be 1 half, 
then you have this expression. You see that from rho sigma and tau, we move to the we move to the notation of b theta and h bar. Okay. So just have you know relabel the the underlying parameters. Okay, the self-adjoint representation of this algebra looks like this. Okay. So this was all about the this was all about the um, the equivalent uh, the unitarily equivalent representations of G and C. Now, now for the Wigner function, you know that the uh, Wigner function is like the opposite of the wild quantization technique. You know. You you dequantize thing. You, know. you you have these uh, rank one operators, and you want to represent these rank one operators as some interesting function on a phase space. That is Wigner function. Okay. So we have this rank one operator, and is is the, is the seminal is the work of by Wigner in, in his seminal paper in 1948. So this was the expression that he found. So. So here, um, so lambda and chi are the are L2 functions on R2. So this is what Wigner wrote in his seminal paper. So this is the quantum mechanical result. What is a non-commutative quantum mechanical analog of AD? That is the question we are addressing. So it's Wigner's uh, formula. How does it look? And we have found that we, we can figure it out entirely by just Approaching the problem uh, group theoretically, just by from all the representations of the uh, of the of the near potent group G and C. So I haven't, you know, written down things here pretty, uh, elaborately. What is like, you know, we, we, in order to find the Wigner function in that way, uh, you one has to find the Planchetel measure in the unitary dual and incorporating that Planchetel measure into appropriate formula, one finds the Wigner function. Okay, so here, here is what it looks like. When you put everything in the formula, you know, the, I think it's uh, Hartmut Fur and, uh, and Tarek Ali, they, they published the paper in, uh, in, in maybe in 2002 or 2001, so here, they had the formula there. We just plugged in the, the corresponding uh, corresponding uh, things in the formula and found out this expression. Here, here it is important to note that so these these are actually we we first fix this rho sigma and tau rho sigma and tau they they label the unitary irreducible representations of G and C. We fixed rho to be K1, sigma to be K2, and tau to be K3 once and for all. And after that, for this K1, K2, K3, we have coadjoint orbit, a coadjoint orbit. And on that coadjoint orbit, you have unitarily equivalent representations of G and C as you vary L and M. So for all such L and M, you can find Wigner functions like this. Okay. So here this we, we call these these variables P P P1, P2, Q1 and Q2 in terms of this K1 star, K2 star, K3 star, K4 star. What are these star things? star k1 star k2 star k3 star and k4 star they are the a point on the coadjoint orbit because that's a four dimensional coadjoint orbit so you have four coordinates this k1 star k2 star k3 star and k4 star are the coordinates you know the, the coordinates of a point on the coadjoint orbit and k1, k2, k3 are the fixed values of rho, sigma, and tau. Then it looks like this. Okay. So in the work, we also address the marginality properties of the Wigner functions as well. When we write things in terms of these this new non-commutating coordinates, 
things are pretty much like what Wigner found, the marginality conditions. It exactly looks like what Wigner found. But if we write things in terms of these star coordinates, then certain star products come in the picture. Like star theta, star h cross, star h cross b theta that I haven't discussed in this talk, actually. So they also come into the picture, the corresponding star products. So what you are doing is that you, you say you, you fix a coadjuvant orbit, you take two Wigner functions on, supported on the coadjuvant orbits, you take the, if, if you just take the multiplication of these two Wigner functions, they are not going to be supported on the same coadjuvant orbit. You have to deform the product and introduce the star product to keep the resulting Wigner function on the same coadjuvant orbit. So they have all been discussed in the paper. Okay. All right. So let's move on. So now the thing is that for for the NCQM in Landau gauge, when we choose L to be one and M to be zero, that those non-commuting non-commuting coordinates they look like this in terms of k1 star, k2 star, k3 star, k4 star, and k1, k2, k3. And the, for the symmetric gauge, these non-commuting coordinates look like this. Okay, so if you plug in these expressions, these, these, these expressions, each for the expression, you get a Wigner function here. All right. <coughs> okay. Now, um, so now th there are some future directions that I, I want to talk about. So, inspired by Fedosov's construction of deformation quantization, we want to study the following. There are motivations for studying the following. So, Fedosov started with an arbitrary finite dimensional symplectic manifold. And then considers the Weyl algebra bundle, which he calls Weyl algebra bundle. And he forms this bundle by replacing by replacing the the, the tangent spaces, which are symplectic vector spaces, with the associative algebra of formal power series in H cross, whose coefficients, so you have this formal power series in H cross. And the coefficients of this formal power series are smooth functions on the respective tangent spaces, which are symplectic vector spaces. So it's like you, you had this symplectic manifold, and you replace the each of uh, you know you, you, if you if you consider the tangent bundle in the bundle, you replace the the symplectic vector spaces or the tangent spaces with these associative algebras, and this is what the so-called Weyl algebra bundle. The sections of this Weyl algebra bundle are precisely the formal power series. Then he, he takes two such sections and writes the star product between them because they are non commutative. Okay, so here is the, our proposal. Okay, we, we want to do similar things. We'd like to start with a nilpotent Lie group instead, find its unitary dual. It's a rough description. We, I haven't worked it out yet. Like, the proposal. Find its unitary dual. Then we would look at the foliation of the dual algebra as a dual as a vector space. It will be foliated into coadjuvant orbits. The coadjuvant orbits are even dimensional phase space, which are symplectic vector spaces, naturally. There will be an appropriate base manifold, which are which are of course the unitary dual, because the, the base manif manifold here labels the the coadjuvant orbits, which is precisely the unitary dual because of this nil potency. Okay. Base manifold over which the fibers are the coadjuvant orbits, it's just the polarization you're considering. You're polarizing the, du the dual Lie algebra as a dual vector space into the coadjuvant orbits. Now, you, you remove this, uh, the coadjuvant orbits, and consider the, the bundle structure with the fibers replaced by uh, 
um, I think it's here. Now, inspired by Fedosov's construction, we want to replace these fibers. The fibers are coadjuvant orbits with formal power series in par par parameters that label them. Okay, so now the, the associative algebras are formal power series in the, in the, in the, in the parameters that label the coadjuvant orbits, which means the unitary dual. Okay? So, if we do so, then the underlying bundle can be called, we can call them the nilpotent Lie algebra bundle. Okay? Instead of calling it while algebra bundle, we are calling it nilpotent Lie algebra bundle. So, what is the nice thing about it? The nice thing about it is that we are not bringing the H cross you know, from the sky. The, the, the underlying deformation parameters coming naturally from the unitary dual of the group. That is the point. Now you see that Fedosov, what Fedosov did in his, in his work, he, so out of the symplectic connection, he started with a symplectic manifold. He has a natural symplectic connection out of which he constructed the, the connection on the, the wild algebra bundle. So we can, we can see how it turns out for our construction. Okay. In the proposed construction, the base manifold of the nilpotent Lie algebra bundle, we are calling it nilpotent Lie algebra bundle, will precisely be the deformation parameters. H. So, for, okay. So, in our case, the you see that I, I told you that when we write the 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 product of two Wigner functions, we have deformed the product using H cross D and theta. They were precisely the the, the unitary dual of the group G and C, okay? So now in this case, in this case, so the most general case, the unitary dual will be the deformation parameter space. Okay. And from Kirillov's theory, these parameters describe the smooth formations of the coadjuvant orbits in the unitary dual, in, in the dual Lie algebra, okay? Now this is the point. I am not sure if under such construction, where the deformation parameters describe such smooth foliation, may address the convergence issues of a formal power series. I'm not sure. So it's just a you know, proposal. Because my deformation parameters are not coming in from the sky, so they are just appearing naturally from the unitary dual of the Lie group under construction. So one can check if, if it resolves the convergence issues of the formal power series. So, so there are two nice examples. One is the example of the Weil-Heisenberg group, which, which is known to everyone. There is a rather interesting case, which is the case of GNC, actually. For, for which, you see that uh, the triple H cross B theta, which we, cho we, which we chose as the deformation parameters, they are actually, this triple is a unitary dual of GNC. So I am just wondering if one could work out the general construction and see, you know, inspired by these two examples and titles of work, so that is, you know, I'm looking forward to. I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much.